is we always sow seed as well. And we really believe that's important as a church. It's important for you to know that, um, that we get to do it. And I got a phone call a few months ago from a friend of mine. Actually, he's one of our leaders of our organization. And he said, hey, there's a church that um, is not going to make their escrow, uh, escrow or got, don't have enough to finish their escrow. And they've been really, it's, they've been uh, a church portable for 10 years. And, and he didn't have to tell me anything else after that. I kind of knew already this was the will of God for us to do that. And um, I really believe that what you make happen for others, God makes happen for you. And, um, and so we were like, you know, anytime, you know, you get a phone call like that from credible people and, and you just see it in your spirit and you see it in your heart. And um, so I, I told our East Campus, um, excuse me, our South Bay Campus, I got a phone call yesterday from the pastor over there that uh, put an offer into another building. And there's another church that um, has put in the offer as well. So they, they notified the, the pastor that hopefully will take that building um, if they get it. Um, that they'll know next week. But I told Pastor Billy, I said, hey, there's nothing to worry about because we got seed in the ground, right? And as long as you got seed in the ground, how many of you know that God make it happen? If it ain't that one, then it'll be something else, right? And so it's good, amen? So thank you so much for your generosity and you made it happen. And, um, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a significant amount um, that we were able to give. Also, coming up is our Wonder of Christmas. And, uh, and if you haven't got your tickets, make sure you do that. It is a ticketed event only for the simple reason it's free, but it's just a ticketed event just so that um, you can, um, we make sure we have a seat just for you. And so we, we want to make sure you grab those after service. Amen. You ready to get in the word today? Come on, can you stand and give our online audience a big, big, big round of applause. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for watching. Um, We've been in this series called The Gospel of Christmas, and, you know, one of the things that for me, and, um, and that is that I, I, I love the fact that you know the story of Christmas about how Jesus was born in a manger, and, you know, and, and, you know, he's born of a virgin and all these great things, but to me, I always like to know the back, the back story of it. What does it look like? How did, it, how did that even come to pass? And, and all my life, I've always been the kind of person that... Um, was never a surface kind of guy. Like, you know, it's almost like my mother would always tell me, you're the most positive, skeptical person I've ever met. And she goes, you're going to make a good pastor. And uh, even though um, at that time I didn't want to. But, but really what it is, is, is like, I want to be convinced. Like, show me the proof. And today, I want to show you as we launch this series called The Gospel of Christmas, based out of Romans chapter 1, and look what it says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. And we learned last week that, that before there was the gospel of Jesus being born, there was the gospel of God. And it says, which he promised before through his prophets. And, and we know who his prophets were. Those were, those were the spokespeople in the Old Testament, the spokespeople for the New Testament were disciples. And so we know that, that, that that's when he was revealing those to, in, in, in the Holy Scriptures. And listen, he told him, he says, it's concerning his son, Jesus Christ, the anointed king, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And Paul is saying it started way back then. Okay, what you're going to be encountering today, it started way back then, and nothing thwarted the plan. And, and I want to speak to you today really about what it is like about really having the gospel of Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation. Give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say... Amen. You may be seated. If you don't have a message outline, our ushers will be more than happy to get you one. We're learning that this whole gospel of Christmas about really the, the encapsulation of a baby being born with such a, um, a, a, a sound from heaven and, and all the people coming to see this, that, that it started with a choice. And that choice was really the gospel of God. And I shared that last week. And, and then we had the crown, which we're going to talk about today, which really is his son, Jesus, the anointed king, our Lord. And then next week, we will talk about the cross and why was it so significant 
about the cross. And just one little snippet about that is that, that God had already planned the cross um, before Jesus was ever in the crib. And that's just something for you to think about, that how God already has your end. He already knows what your future looks like, even sometimes before we begin it. And then we're going to end it Christmas weekend on the crib being the seed of David. And what we learned is we learned that there had to be bad news so that the good news can come. And we learned that, that when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, they were in perfect unity with God and commune, communion with God. And, and next thing you know, they land up sinning. And when they land up sinning for the first time, bad news comes. And bad news happens. And now because there was bad news, there was the, the need for good news. And, 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 and that need came in what we call the form of the gospel. And this is where we get the word. That word gospel actually comes from two words. That means good spell. Or in the Greek, it really means just the good news. And so, so we learned that because there were bad news, we now need good news. And in that good news was the plan that God has. And in that, we found that in Jeremiah chapter 29, where it says, for I know the plans I have for you. Not speaking past tense, speaking, he says, no, I know them. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not making them as I go. Uh, your, your, your life and, and the direction at times you wanted to take your life doesn't make me change my mind about yours. So I, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And here's what we learn about when you, when you bring those two together, and that is that God's gospel equals God's plan. And, and what that really means is, is that if God's gospel is the good news, then it should equal a good plan. And so the fact that you are walking in the gospel today, you have accepted the good news of Jesus. Listen, your life should be on a good plan, which means that you should be tasting and seeing the good things that God has for your life. And we can all remember the times when we weren't walking in the good news, that, 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 that our life always ended up in a bad plan. And so your plans... Um, come as you go. Your plans are conditional. God already had a plan for your life. So everything you're stepping into and everything you're about to step into, God already has it all uh, settled and God has it all planned out. And so what we learned last week in this one saying, and that is this, that the good news is that the bad news is wrong. So that, so that, so that the reality is, is that whatever wrong you have faced in your life, God has the ability to turn that situation around. And so in doing that, God had to put a plan together. And I showed you last week that through the 66 books of the Bible, Jesus is in every single one of them. But then the question you would ask and the question I would ask is, why did it take so long? If, if, if Adam and Eve sinned, why would God want to take thousands of years to bring the answer in the form of a baby. What, what, why would it be that? And, and here's what you have to realize, and that is that before the baby could be born, the plan had to be in place. That before the baby could be born, the plan had to be in place. And you say, Pastor Robert, what does that have to do with me? It has everything to do with you. That before your dreams can come to pass, you have to realize that there's already a plan in place. And that what God is trying to show you throughout the Bible is, is that I have a plan. And every time you try to come in and interrupt it, you're the one that messes it up. But it still doesn't change the plan that I have for you. And so the bad news only backs you up to the point that the only thing you can accept is the good news. Because why do people continue to repeat bad things? It's because they're really not ready to change because of the good things. And so, and so God takes his time. And the reason why God takes his time is because when he delivers what he has for your life, it is not going to be partial or mediocre. It's going to be in its fullness. 
And so we sit there and we wait sometimes. And we're like, God, you know, I just don't know why this isn't happening. God, I wish you would do it much faster. And God says, listen, if you knew my plan, you would wait in patience. You would just trust me. And this is why not 99% of the time, not, not 99.9%, this is 100% that every one of us can look back after we have gone through a season of trials or tribulations or storms and we've gone through seasons of waiting and we look back and we go, man, I'm so glad God didn't give me what I was asking when I was going through that. Why? Because at the end of the day, he knows the ultimate plan. He has it all in store. And so all of a sudden, Adam and Eve mess up what God did for them. And then God says, okay, I got a plan. And in Genesis chapter 3, it says, I will put the enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Speaking of Jesus, he shall bruise your head. So in other words, He's saying the one I'm going to sin is going to crush the head of a serpent. He's going to crush the one that literally he's going to demolish it to the point that it cannot be put back together. But then it goes on to say, but you shall, but, but, and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, he's telling the enemy, hey, you shall bruise him, but you're not going to kill him. Because he'll get wounded, 39 stripes on his back. He will get a, 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 a sword stuck in his side. He will get a, cums, a couple of bumps and bruises. But what he's going to do to you is he's going to crush you. All you're going to do is bruise him. So God already painted the picture. He was like, all right, here's the plan. I'm going to show it to you. And, and so what he does is that before this baby can be born in which you're going to receive everything that I had in store for you, I have to restore what's been lost in the garden. And so the, so, so the Bible takes us through eight different covenants. And every one of them was already, and, and could, and was already in fruition before Adam ever sinned. That, that eventually they would, ex, they would have all of this. The problem is, is that they landed up messing it up. And God says, okay, you know what? Guess what I got to do now? I got I to make sure you get every one of these. And the first covenant that God gave was Eden's covenant, which focuses on fruitfulness. In other words, God decided a long time ago, before Adam and Eve ever sinned, he says, your life's going to be fruitful. Everything about your life is fruitful. Think about it. God could have started any covenant at any time, but he chose the one called fruitfulness. In other words, your whole life is going to be the fight for the fruits. And you got to realize your life was designed to live, in, 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 live fruitful. Think about it in Galatians when Paul's talking about the fruit of the spirits. He's saying, okay, the first one is, you know, love, joy, and peace. Those are things you choose. You got to choose every day to walk in love. You got to choose every day to walk in joy. And you got to choose every day to walk in peace. That's a choice. You, got, you, you choose who you love, right? You don't love everybody. Well, you should, but you don't love everybody. But at the end of the day, you choose who you love. So every day you got to wake up and say, I choose to walk in love. I choose to walk in joy. And I choose to walk in peace. Before I step outside and allow circumstances around me to change that. So, so, so he noticed the first fruits that he gives us, the first three, is a choice. It's what you choose. The second three is what you possess. He says, all right, if you choose love, if you choose to walk in joy, and you choose to walk in peace, well, here's what you're going to possess. You're going to possess patience, kindness, and goodness. Now, everyone sits there and goes, well, I just want to be patient. Patient has nothing to do with your personality. Let me rewind that again. Patience has nothing to do with your personality. Well, Pastor Obed, my, you know, my husband is patient. He's patient with you. Because Paul lets us know in 1 Corinthians how patience is established. He says love is what? Patient and kindness. Which lets me know that the people we love the most are the people we have the patience the most. Come on. I know it's early. For instance, 
Most people in here are the patient with their kids. Man, if some people would do to you what your kids have done, you'd have cut them off a long time ago. You'd have been like, forget you, and no, I don't you, I don't need you in my life. Man, listen, what you know, you 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 know, you throw you you throw them out the curb. Why why do you why do you put up with your kids so much? Because you love them. Love is what? Patient. And so if I choose love and I choose peace and I choose joy, then I possess gentleness, I mean patience, kindness, and gentleness. And then once I possess gentleness, kindness, and patience because I choose love, joy, and peace, now I become a person of self-control. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so you'll never have self-control if you're not walking in patience, kindness, and goodness, but you'll never have patience, kindness, and goodness if you don't first choose to walk in love, joy, and peace. And so at the end of the day, you got to wake up every day going, I choose to walk in joy. I choose to walk in. There's days I wake up with an elephant on my chest. There's days I wake up with burdens and stress. But that does not take away the fact of what I can choose. I cannot choose my battles, but I can choose what I want to walk in. And every day I choose to walk in love, joy, and peace. And that's why sometimes people look at me and say, man, why are you so calm? No, no, no. I'm calm not because I want to be calm. I'm calm because I chose First, before I face that bad baby to walk in love, joy, and peace. Therefore, I can have patience, kindness, and goodness. Come on, and I can literally have the life of one of self-control. So at the end of the day, your life was a life destined to fruitfulness. The second covenant he established was the, the covenant of forgiveness. This is what he did in Genesis 3. He took the animal, the Bible says, what he, you know, when he sees Adam and Eve, and he says, what did you do? And, and, and we sinned. And Who told you that? We're naked. Who told you that? And, and, and what does the Bible say? The Bible says, it's, a, it's one little small verse. And the Bible says, and God clothed Adam and Eve with the skin of animals. Well, how do, you, how, do you, how do you take the skin of an animal if you don't sacrifice it? So the first sacrifice for the covering of sin happened to the one who sinned in the first place. So God says, okay, now I'm going to establish the covenant of forgiveness. Then the third covenant was the covenant, Noah's covenant, which is the focus on the family. If you remember what happened to Cain and Abel, the family had issues. One killed the other. So what did God say? No, 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 wait a minute. I, I need to establish the covenant of family. So, so look what happens. God says, okay, I'm going to establish the covenant of fruitfulness. Adam and Eve are going to sin. Now I'm going to establish the covenant of forgiveness. And now that they have forgiveness, i got to make sure the family is intact. So I'm going to establish the covenant of family. And then next thing you know, he gives us the fourth covenant, which is Abraham's covenant, which focuses on friendship. In other words, it focuses on your inheritance. That this is why later on Jesus would be identified as as, as a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That in other words, everything that belongs to him will belong to you. So just watch how God is painting this. He's saying, listen, your life is designed to be fruitful. Next thing you know, Adam sinned, you need forgiveness. Once Adam sinned, guess what? Your family may be disarray, but I'm going to make a covenant that your family shall be saved. And then, get, then now I'm going to establish a covenant with you that you shall walk in the blessings of the Lord, that the blessings of Abraham will be upon your life. Just look what God's doing. And then all of a sudden, the fifth covenant he establishes, the Moses covenant, which he focuses on following. In other words, he gives us the commandments. You want to follow me? Here's my parameters. Here's what I do. God gave Moses 10. Out of those 10, there were 613 that were expressed. And so by the time it got to Jesus, there were 613. I mean, try to live by 613. I mean, it's hard. And so Jesus said, wait a minute, time out, time out. I know it started with 10, and then by the time I got here, it's 613 expressions you got to live by. So I'm going to simplify it. I'm just going to live. 
You just got to live by two. Can you imagine that, getting that good news that day? Like, hey, guys, guess what? Out of all these commandments, you just got to live by two. Well, the first five have to do with love the Lord your God with all your heart. The second five have everything to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So Jesus said, listen, it started with 10. It was expressed to 613. But now that I'm the one that fulfilled the law, guess what? If you just live by these two, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and you love your neighbor as you love yourself, then I promise you, you will live a good life. So, so think about the covenant he established. He had covenant, the covenant of fruitfulness, the covenant of forgiveness, the covenant of family. Now he's giving you the, co- I call it the covenant of Moses, which is the covenant of principles. That if you literally walk in the principles of God, God is the God of principles. As long as you're within his principles, he will bless your life. But it's amazing how everybody wants to be blessed when they're not following the principles of God. And so he gives you. He gives you these principles, and why does he give you these principles? So that, listen, you can make decisions by them, you can live by them, because you're either going to make decisions based on principle, principle or you're going to make decisions based on pressure. And usually decisions made on pressure will cause you to compromise decisions based on principle. And, and, and so, so, so that's what he did. And then the sixth covenant he gave us was Israel's covenant, which focuses on faithfulness. And in Deuteronomy 29, he starts giving you land. Hello. He starts giving you homes that you didn't even build. Come on. He gives you an inheritance that you didn't even plant for. So just just think how God's working this out. He's saying, okay, the covenant of fruitfulness, the covenant of forgiveness, the covenant of family, the covenant of of, of my parameters, and and, and the covenant of blessings. And guess what? And now I'm going to give you the covenant of faithfulness. You don't know what it's like to be faithful. You've been unfaithful. But because I'm going to swear this to myself and my plan will come to pass with you or without you, I'm going to make sure that you're blessed. He gave you that covenant. And then he says, all right, now here's, here's the seventh covenant. This is the, the, the covenant of fulfillment. And I love this one. This, this is what I actually must say this is one of my favorites. Because God chooses to begin his lineage of how the Messiah and whom the Messiah would be born of by a person who was overlooked by his own father. By a person in some sense was not even his dad's first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice, fifth choice, sixth choice, seventh choice, not even his. Not, it, 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 was, it wasn't even his dad's choice. Can I go further? It was the it was the only son that Jesse had that wasn't born out of marriage. For David was born from a concubine, which in a modern day term, it's a one night stand. And most people would call that, you know, most people that would grow up sitting there saying, my, 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 my mother gave birth to me from a one night stand. I never met my father. Most people would grow up with, with, an, with, with, with an inferiority complex in them, feeling like I'm, I'm not even worth it. I, 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 mean, I never even met my dad. I, I, look, look, I was born a mistake. And I love how God uses a person to birth the lineage of the Savior of the world that will save humanity. You would think, you would think that, man, that person would have to be perfect. That person would have to come from the Brady Bunch, not a family with married with children. Come on, right? And, and, and you would think that person would have to be grandiose, the one first in line, super righteous. But at the end of the day, this was the same one that was, that, was, that, was, that was exonerated to be king over Israel and failed God. Landed up having, committing adultery, having an affair, and God says, listen, I'm not done with you. And gave him a second chance. At the end of the day, it's the covenant of fulfillment. Because here's what God wants to wipe the excuse you constantly give him. Well, maybe the reason why my life isn't the way it is right now is because, God, I've just been messing up. And, God, because I've just been messing up my life, you know. And, listen, you get more down on yourself than than the devil does. And you're constantly just, well, you know, if I would have not done this and I would have No, no, no. You're not that good. Come on, let me me give you some. let, Let me blow your bubble right now. You're not that good. You're not that good to mess up God's plan. Let me just kind of help you out there because when you walk around sitting there going, well, you know, you just don't understand pastoral band, man. I had a bad past, man. You understand? I keep on making mistakes. You're not that good. 
At the end of the day, God's plan will come to pass. And if he has to sit there and knock you off the horse like he did Saul, he'll knock you off a horse. If that means he got to take everything away from you for you to finally realize that you ain't all that in a bag of chips, he'll do it. Because he is going to get you one way or the other because his plan will succeed. And every time you sit there, well, God, you don't understand me. I messed up. And God's like, well, you think you're that good? You ain't that good. And then finally he gave us the new covenant, which focuses on our forever. This is when he told the children of Israel through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, I'm going to take this big house called the temple that you guys would come in and you would come and, get, you'd come and see me. I'm going to put it in your heart. You're going to carry it. You're going to be a carrier of my glory. So, 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 so the reason why I wanted to show you this is because I wanted to show you be careful what to ask for too soon because it started off with the covenant of fruitfulness, forgiveness, family, blessings. He gave you, uh, he, 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 gave, he, he gave you the fulfillment. He, he gave you all these covenants. And then all of a sudden, here's this baby that's born to a virgin, which encapsulates in flesh every covenant that was established so that you and I would have something we could base our life on, that he would swore it only to himself, every covenant he established. So that when you are facing an issue and your children are not serving the Lord, you can remind God of the covenant that he made with Noah. Lord, if you rescued his family, you'll rescue my family too. I have a covenant promise from you on that. Listen, he made a promise that, you know what, man, man, Pastor Robert, I feel like I've messed up. No, he's made a covenant of forgiveness. And if he can cover the sin of the people that actually committed it, Adam and Eve, he can cover your sins as well because that's the kind of God we serve. Well, Pastor Obey, you understand, man. I mean, I just feel like I'm left out. I'm not shocked that the family that was on the video got their dream house. I'm not shocked when people come to me and tell me stuff like that. Pastor Obey, you understand, I moved into a dream house. Pastor Obey, I opened up a business. Pastor Obey, I got a promotion. I mean, often they look at me and they go, they're looking at my response, but I'm never shocked. Why? It's a covenant promise. You shouldn't be shot. It should be something you expect to walk in every day. I'm a child of God. I only expect the best that God has for my life. Because why? It belongs to you because Jesus, the fulfillment, is in your heart. He gave you every covenant. So he gave us Jesus. And then he, then he chooses the place to do it. And that place he did it was, watch this. In Luke 2, it says, and the angel said to them, fear not. The angel says, hey, don't, just don't fear. For behold, I bring you what? Good news. What is the good news? It's the gospel and the plan. So when Jesus was born in flesh was the good news and a good plan. And he's going to come into your heart. But you can never have the good plan without accepting the good news. And he says this. There was great joy that for all the people, for unto you born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. He, he, God came through at the perfect timing. Because then Paul talks about the fulfillment. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, but each in his own rank in turn, Christ the Messiah is the first fruit, which the first covenant was be fruitful. He's the first, because it all begins with him. And he says this, then those who are Christ's own will be resurrected at his coming. After that comes the end, the completion, when he delivers over the kingdom to God, the Father, after rendering inoperative and abolishing every other rule and every authority and power. For Christ must be king and reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And so God says, listen. I, I'll finish every battle. And that is why, listen, in Matthew it says this. When they saw the star, I just want you to think about this for a moment. 
They had been waiting for this. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Why would, they, why, why would there be such great joy? Why? Because every fulfillment of every covenant was right there. And the Bible says this, and they fell down and they worshiped him. Because what else do you do? What else do you do when the fulfillment of every covenant is right in front of you? you, you, you what are you supposed to say? Thank you, Lord. Now, that, you, would, you and I would think that's not good enough. <laughs> Jesus, I, I love you. No, no, no. You and I would still think it's not good enough. So what did they do? They, they fell. What else can they do? You want to know what you're going to do when you get to heaven? You're going to see the fulfillment of everything you've, t you've, talk you you've read about. And you're not going to have a word. Your worship's just going to be like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> And this is what I like to say. Why don't you fall on earth before you fall in heaven? Well, why, 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 don't you, why don't you take in the honest of God now? Because everything he's saying is true. And, 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 and the Bible says, and then they opened their treasures and they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What else would they do? I mean, I'm going to hold on to everything? How can you? When everything in front of you, that you mean I'm going to possess property I never have, I never, I don't deserve? That I... You, you, you mean I'm, I, I'm going to get a, a new chance at life? You mean to tell me I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to live a fruitful life? You mean to tell me my dreams can come to pass despite all the stuff that, I, that I've done in disobedience of my life? You mean to tell me, I, why would you? Like, like, like why, why would you stay home? Why would you not want to do something? And I really believe that that, that the Spirit of the Lord kind of gave them an idea of what to bring. Because it's not by accident what they brought. See, what can we learn from those men that were just in the awness of God, sitting there, the fulfillment of every prophecy? See, the reality is that their worship, number one, became personal. It became personal. It's like, you know... When you don't care who's around, like you, you're like sitting there going like, I, I, mean, I don't care. I don't care what I look like, how I look. Like that don't matter. You didn't do it for me. He did. So I'm going to worship him. It was personal. Not only was it personal, but number two, their worship was relational. It was relational. They were like, you know what? Like we actually get to have a relationship and then the third is that, as I close, they, their worship was intentional. It was intentional. Like, I actually have the opportunity to, to do something. The Bible says, the Bible says that, that decide in your own heart. It's you, you make that decision. Not, not, not us. You make it. You got to decide every day in your heart, I'm going to live for him. You got to decide in your heart every day, I'm not going to retaliate, get angry, get offended. No, no, no. No, I'm going to decide in my heart that my worship is going to be personal, it's going to be relational, it's going to be intentional, and then lastly, it's going to be resourceful. Like, I, I'm going to do something. I, I want to do it. It's what I want. And the Bible says that, what it, that they, they, they literally bowed. And, and the question is, what, what did they do when they saw the fulfillment? They worshiped. What else do you do? You worship. And the Bible says they, they came with something. They didn't come empty-handed. They came with something. And my mama taught me as a little young boy, you know, when you go to someone's house, you know, they invite you to come over, you bring something. You know, they're always going to tell you, oh, no, you don't have to bring nothing. We got everything covered. Go buy some flowers. I get some young people coming to my house sometimes. They come to my house. Hey, guys, we got football, man. We got, bring your, bring your wives. It's going to be incredible. We're going to have a great time. 
we got a bunch of food. They show up. And then I, I, I take the guys individually. I said, hey, you didn't bring anything. And they're like, oh, no, you, you told us not to. I said, no, 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 no. You didn't need to bring no food. And then let, me, let me give you a fatherly lesson here. At the end of the day, when you come to someone's house, you, you bring something. Okay, you, that, that's, that's, that's called manners. Right, come on, all, all the seasoned people know what I'm talking about. It was, it was like this morning, 8 o'clock, all the grandmas were shaking their head like, yeah. That new millennial generation was like, what are you talking about? You invited me. No, 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 you, you, you bring something. Let me help you out here, okay? They're always going to tell you don't bring nothing. They're probably meaning food. That means they got it covered. But you bring a flower. You stop at the store, they're about 10 bucks, okay? You want carnations, they're four, okay? But you come with something. What does that show? It shows honor. I honor that. Thank you for allowing me to come. Honor is the only thing that breaks entitlement. I honor that. It's what I do. See, they brought something. What did they bring? They brought, they brought the gold. It represented the anointed king. They brought the frankincense. It, 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 it represented the anointed priesthood. And they brought the myrrh. It, was, it represented the anointed prophet. Matter of fact, up until then, there was only one who sat in two offices, and that was Melchizedek. He sat as a king, and he sat as a priest, but he didn't see it as a prophet. And so could you imagine everyone that was there? Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You're bringing gold, but we're in a barn. Does that mean he's a king? Yes. You're bringing frankincense. Wait a minute. Does that mean he's a priest? Wait a minute, you brought myrrh? He's the fulfillment. I understand now why you guys have bowed when you got here. Because he encompasses everything that has been spoken out of the mouth of the prophets. It's what he does. What did they do? They opened up their treasures and they offered gifts. Today is our sacred Sunday. Normally, we would have you come up here and walk, but because of our time of our services, we're just going to go into to worship, and, and I'm pretty sure you came prepared. If not, you, you can still today. If you want a, a commitment card, you, it's, it was on your, 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 your chair, and if not, you could put it in your envelope like my wife and I, we did, and, and I'll tell you, we only do this once, once a year, and be honest, just to kind of be, you know, open and transparent, it's my wife and I woke up this morning and we're just like, it's Sacred Sunday and we're all excited about it, but, you know, there's, we're not walking around with this load of pressure uh, like we have in the past because really in some sense, God has just been so faithful. He's been good. Three years ago, you gave at this time and we launched our West Campus and and they're up and running, and they're, they're doing Sacred Sunday today. And two years ago, you gave significantly, and we, we launched our South Bay campus, and they're putting out chairs at service. And, and they're, they're in the opportunity to, to get a new building and could, could happen if that other church gets theirs. But if not, they'll be positioned for opportunity. And that's what's awesome. And then last year, you gave, and, and we got our, our, our building ourselves, and it's our alley building, and, and uh, man, I just got our, um, the news this past week that our um, CUP would be given to us um, before the end of the year, and so we're very, very excited about that because that starts moving everything forward, but really today we're given an opportunity. We're, we're, it's what we're doing, and you know, for my wife and I, we, we need a miracle. We, we have something in, our, in, in, in front of us that 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 big and and we're just like God we want you to trust us and I think that's what it always boils down to what it always boils down to is not that God can get it to you is that can God get it through you and what when you invest in eternity you're investing in God's future and when you invest in God's future he invests in yours and this is why I wake up today with such anticipation I mean we were excited, but we were just like, wow, God, you've been so faithful. You've been consistent. 
And so what we're going to do, and, and again, we no pressure, and you know, this is something we want it to be out of your own heart. And you decide in your heart, and you know, people, some people have already stepped up and have given significantly, but that doesn't mean you don't. Don't, don't live off of someone else's blessing, live off your own. And you do what, what you decide in your heart. And so we're going to stand. And when you're ready to stand, you can stand. We're going to sing. And then I'm going to come back. We're going to have communion. Let me just tell you a little bit about them cups because first service, they were like, what is this? And, and the reason why we did it is because of time. But really, it's two seals. One opens up the top for the cracker. The other one opens up the bottom for the, for the, for the juice. So it's very simple. Um, and we just got our, our, our chairs clean, and we want to keep them clean, okay? And so you could do that, but our worship team is going to sing. We're going to sing a song, and then Lisette and I are going to come back. We're going to bless the offering, and it's going to be fantastic. Let's, let's lift up the name of Jesus.